professor krishna you can yes. unmute yourself you, you can you can start speaking just one line professor krishna is born in was born in chennai and brought up in indore he did his his parents are educationists he did his master degree in delhi in 1959 phd in 62 from the banaras hindu university his phd thesis was published by john wille and sons new york year as a book entitled uh, entitled polymorphism and polytypism in crystals in 66 from 66 to 86 he served as a professor in banaras hindu university and then personal request of jake the uh, krishnamurthy he joined rajghat as director from it is in in the year of 1986 in case circle he is known figure now you can start sir sir you, you have to unmute your sir professor, professor yeah, i yes. i know that unmute and then start <clears throat> thank you sushil for that introduction <laughs> reminding me of my past life <clears throat> You know, we are taught separate arts of painting and sculpture and music and literature in our education. But Krishnamurti talked as early as 1930s about the art of living. Later on, of course, this phrase has been. adopted by modern gurus but what they mean by art of living is quite different from what krishna ji meant by the art of living so i am going to <clears throat> introduce what krishna ji meant by art of living and also add to it my own investigations of the art so not everything that i say you will find in the books of krishnamurti because some of it is based on my own investigation but the whole investigation is based on krishna ji's description of that art and the need for us to investigate and learn that art <clears throat> now the main purpose of art all art is to communicate a sense of beauty when everything is in the right proportion which can't be predefined it produces a sense of beauty and creates a certain joy in our consciousness when you are engaging in that activity provided of course one has the sensitivity to perceive the beauty <clears throat> so krishna ji talked about the joy that is there in living and which comes from this perception of beauty in all aspects of our life there is great beauty in nature there is great beauty in friendship there is beauty in science and mathematics in all the different arts <coughs> which we learn about in games and sports there is no aspect of life which does not have a sense of beauty but one needs to be sensitive that means one needs to have the perception of that beauty then one experiences the joy of that aspect of life <clears throat> unfortunately our society 
as well as our education, puts great emphasis on achievement and wants people to achieve better and better results compared to other people. This directs all the attention in the area of our ambition. And that blocks sensitivity because sensitivity comes through contact, not you can't learn that <clears throat> from a teacher or from a book. It's part of self-knowledge. It includes the physical elements to have <clears throat> highly sensitive senses, just the bodily senses. And more importantly, it includes the capacity to observe and pay attention. And that's contrary to the ambitious mind. The ambitious mind is trying to go in a particular direction. We are told that what is important is to have noble ambitions and not have ignoble ambitions. That's all part of conditioning. But all ambition <coughs> destroys sensitivity because it means that we are utilizing time to go in a particular direction only. And therefore, other directions in life become distractions. And one avoids distractions and concentrates only in the direction in which one's ambition lies. So he wanted to change education. <clears throat> and instead of having this emphasis on achievement, he wanted children to grow up with a learning mind. A learning mind is an observant mind, a silent mind which perceives everything, relates with everything, in so relating, in paying attention to the whole, the sensitivity grows. Now we have examples of that. If you listen to classical music, initially you may not respond to it, but after some time you will start, you will discover that the sensitivity has developed in your mind and you are able to enjoy that music. The same is true of nature. If you watch nature with a sense of leisure, <clears throat> you will in due course perceive the beauty in that nature, its silence, its light and everything that Krishnaji has pointed out. But if you are in a hurry, as the ambitious mind is, you don't have time to pay attention. And therefore, you do not develop sensitivity. And when you don't develop sensitivity, those joys don't enter into your life. And only the joys of achievement the praise that you receive from society for that achievement, which is a form of pleasure, psychological pleasure, becomes important for human beings. And that's a big source of insensitivity. That's why one is constantly bored when there is no activity engaging you. Why would there be boredom if one perceives the beauty in everything in life? There is great beauty in perceiving a blooming tree. There is great beauty in an animal sprinting freely in nature. 
there is great beauty in friendship, in sharing with colleagues and friends, in working together, provided you have space to pay attention to them. And when you pay attention, <clears throat> through that contact, the sensitivity develops. But unfortunately, our education is creating insensitive human beings who are constantly bored unless they are achieving some results. And therefore, the pleasure of achievement and the pleasure of getting more and more becomes extremely important. So there is a great difference between joy and pleasure. And Krishnaji pointed out that. Joy is the innate beauty which is there in that activity. And when you pay attention and you engage in that activity seriously, you find the pleasure. You see the joy. And that joy motivates you. But when you don't receive the joy, you are bored, and therefore you seek pleasure as an escape from boredom. So boredom is a sign of insensitivity. <clears throat> now insensitivity has many causes, not only ambition, which I have pointed out, but also a lazy body, Which, which may also be a consequence of ambition because one doesn't have time to do exercise or yoga or uh, go for walks and so on. It can be due to inadequate sleep. It can be wrong kind of diet. So a lot of physical causes for insensitivity. So Krishnini said it's important to learn the art of learning. The learning means <clears throat> not from a book, but you have to learn this to come upon sensitivity. And you have to take steps to come upon that sensitivity. You have to do the right kind of exercise, eat the right kind of food. In fact, in 1920s, when he was still part of the Theosophical Society. He wrote a book, small booklet called In Preparation, because in those days, they were all preparing for the coming of the world teacher. Krishnaji was not yet the world teacher. <clears throat> so they were all preparing, including himself. And it is surprising that if you read that book, In Preparation, which I sent to Dr. Maheshwari, and he can share it with you if you want. Krishnaji prescribes what is the right kind of diet, what is the right kind of exercise, and how you must prepare yourself in order to be sensitive, both bodily sensitivity and emotional and spiritual sensitivity. Sensitivity being the joy that one experiences in engaging in that particular activity. <clears throat> and when you perceive that joy in every activity, there is so much joy that is available to you that the desire to maximize pleasure disappears. And therefore the desire ceases to be a problem. Desire has become a problem for man because he wants more and more. He keeps comparing, he keeps measuring. So one has to learn all that. Can you relate without measurement, without comparison? Can you pay attention in order to learn, not in order to achieve? The desire to achieve is an ego desire, and it sustains the ego. So ultimately, the ego becomes a 
obstruction to the perception of beauty. Now, in order to come upon the right proportion, it's like a balance. <clears throat> Wherever a balance is involved, including simple things like bicycling or swimming, you can't learn that from a teacher or from a book. You will have to enter the water, engage with it, and you will discover the balance and you can swim. We have all done that. The same is true of driving a car and so on. You can't learn that from a book. The book can give you some guidelines of what to do, what not to do, which you can keep in mind. But ultimately, the balance comes from practicing that. Same is true in music. You start singing the Sarigama and all that, and you are not in swar. But you keep practicing and you discover that there is great joy and there is great beauty when you learn the right swaras. So art cannot be learned from a book. Art has to be learned through sensitivity, which comes from engaging with an observing, learning mind. And therefore, Krishna said it's hard work. It's not just listening to some talk and the guru will give you this sense of beauty. Nobody can give you the sense of beauty, but you can discover it for yourself. And that's why it's part of self-knowledge, not part of knowledge. <clears throat> I brought with me a passage where Krishnaji explains this, which I want to share with you. He says, to learn the art of living, one must have leisure. The word leisure is greatly misunderstood. As we said in our previous talk, Generally, it means not to be occupied with the things we have to do, such as earning a livelihood, going to the office or factory, and so on. And only when that is over is there leisure. During that so-called leisure, you want to be amused. You want to relax. You want to do the things which you really like or which demand your highest capacity. You are earning a livelihood, whatever you do, is in opposition to so-called leisure. So there is always the strain, the tension, and the escape from the tension. And leisure is when you have no strain. During that leisure, you pick up a newspaper, open a novel, chatter, play, and so on. This is the actual fact. This is what is going on everywhere. Earning a livelihood has become the denial of living. So we come to the question, what is leisure? Leisure, as it is understood, is a respite from the pressure of livelihood the pressure of earning a living or any pressure imposed on us, we generally consider an absence of leisure. But there is a much greater pressure in us, conscious or unconscious, which is desire. And we will go into that later. School is a place of leisure. He's talking to students. It's only when you have leisure that you can learn. That is, learning can only take place when there is no pressure of any kind. Learning under pressure is the cultivation of memory, which will help you recognize future danger and so, become, so becomes a mechanical response. Leisure implies a mind which is not occupied. 
it's only then that there is a state of learning. School is a place of learning and not merely a place for accumulating knowledge. This is really important to understand. As we said, knowledge is necessary and has its own limited place in life. Unfortunately, this limitation has devoured all our lives and we have no space for learning. We are so occupied with our livelihood that it takes all the energy of the mechanism of thought so that we are exhausted at the end of the day and need to be stimulated. We recover from this exhaustion through entertainment, religious or otherwise. This is the life of human beings. Human beings have created a society which demands all their time, all their energies, all their life. There is no leisure to learn. And so their life becomes mechanical, almost meaningless. So we must be very clear in the understanding of the word leisure, a time, a period when the mind is not occupied with anything whatsoever. It's the time of observation. It's only the unoccupied mind which can observe. A free observation is the movement of learning. This frees the mind from being mechanical. So there he is laying down very clearly what I have just mentioned, that unless you pay attention and you have no particular direction in which you are trying to achieve results. <clears throat> in that state, this learning which he called self-knowledge takes place. The perception of truth is also comes out of that. Because if you already postulate what the truth is, you don't know it. You're going in a direction without knowing what the truth is. So truth has to be discovered. And that's only possible when you have certain amount of freedom from knowledge and a certain amount of leisure. If you recall in your own life, you will find that there have been moments like that, if not later in life, at least in childhood, when you had nothing to do, when you were just watching and learning, and lots of things revealed themselves through that watching. Unfortunately, society does not value that because they want to use the individual to further the economy. And for that, they want you to become engineers or doctors or whatever. So the poet T.S. Eliot wrote a poem called The Rock, where he raises this question very poignantly in the last paragraph, which I will, last stanza, which I will quote to you. He says, where is the life we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in our knowledge? Where is the knowledge that we have lost in information? In 2000 years, the cycles of fate take us away from God and unto dust. He's essentially pointing out the same tragedy, that this making a living has been given such tremendous importance that it, it becomes a denial of life itself because you have become an insensitive human being. <clears throat> when Krishnaji gave talks in Sanin, there was a time when Fritz of Capra who was the first person to write about consciousness and quantum mechanics and so on in the book called The Tao of Physics. He was very interested in Krishnaji's teachings and he attended some of his talks. Afterwards, he went to Krishnaji 
And he said, sir, do I have to give up my science in order to learn what you are saying? And Krishnaji said, no, sir. <clears throat> but you are a human being first and then a scientist. So learn the art of living, then do your science. Don't do your science at the expense of learning the art of living, because that's far more important than learning any particular subject. So he's pointing out the same thing. And if you notice in your own life, you can see the truth of this, how one gets channelized in life into a narrow street or narrow area and misses out on the rest of life. Life is a very holistic thing. One has relationship to music, to art, to people, to children, to family, all that, to nature, to ideas, to books, literature. And you miss out on all that when you only relate to your office. So it becomes a very big limitation of life. And that's what he's pointing out. <clears throat> so this is what he meant by art of living. It includes a balance between the physical, the intellectual, the emotional, and the spiritual parts of our being. We have these four important aspects to our life. And to harmonize all these is important. Now, again, something you cannot learn from a book. You will have to find out for yourself, to discover that for yourself. Mrs. Radha Bernier told me of an interaction with Krishnaji. He had come back from travel and he looked tired. But he had made an engagement that evening to meet someone. So she suggested, shall I cancel that? Because you look tired, you can do it another day. And he looked at her and he said, my body doesn't oppose what I want to do. Now that's the harmony between body and mind, whatever you have planned, there is no resistance to doing that, <clears throat> which is a total absence of conflict. What we have is that we have planned something and we don't feel like doing it, but we force ourselves to do it. We call that discipline. But it's a form of conflict. So Krishnaji has talked about this art of living as total freedom from any conflict, to live without a single conflict. He gave a talk about this at Rajgat, when which I attended. I came from the university to attend his talks. <clears throat> and it was not, it seemed preposterous to me that there should be complete freedom from all conflict. So I went to him afterwards and I said, sir, <clears throat> your talks are announced six months in advance. If on the day that you have to give that talk, you don't feel like giving, Will it not create conflict? His reply surprised me. He said, no, sir. If I don't feel like giving the talk, I won't give it. But it has never happened. That means for 60 years, he had been lecturing, his talks had been announced. And it had never happened that he didn't feel like doing what he wanted to do, what he had planned to do. So the conflict doesn't come from the timetable. It's not from your decision. <clears throat> the conflict comes because there is this inner resistance within us, the moodiness within us. 
And the art of living demands that we find out the cause of this moodiness and get rid of it, eliminate it. Now, in every aspect of life, there is both a technique to be learned and a spirit, which is the mindset in with, with which you engage in that activity. <clears throat> the technique you can learn from a book or from a teacher, and you can practice it. But the mindset, the spirit is far more important. And the art of living emphasizes that without the spirit, the technique is hollow. Let me explain that. <clears throat> the spirit of art is beauty. The perception of beauty is sensitivity, is the spirit of art. If you don't have that, what is it that you will try to exp express through the technique? When the spirit is there, the technique has value. But when the spirit is not there, the technique has no value or very little value. And when we talk about ambition, we are emphasizing only technique and achievement. In games and sports, there is the sportsman spirit, which demands excellence. And playing the game for the joy of playing, not necessarily for victory. So that when your friend plays better than you and you lose, there is no disappointment. You congratulate him. You, you want to learn, play more with him so that you can learn from him. And there are none of those negative emotions enter into the game, which enter into it when you give tremendous importance to victory. And that spirit, sportsman spirit is far more important than the technique. The technique can be learned, but the sportsman spirit is to engage in it without this ego. Any. In science and mathematics, <clears throat> there is the spirit of science and there is the method of science. I have earlier talked about the scientific method. So I won't do that now. But there is this mindset of curiosity, of inquiring for the sake of discovery, of not knowing and wanting to know the truth of the unknown. And coming upon insights <clears throat> which lead to discovery, not for personal pleasure or gain, but for the joy of learning. So it becomes an art. <clears throat> you can do the same thing for the sake of a reward or an achievement or praise. You can do the same thing simply for the joy of learning. And this, to do it, to use life as a joy for learning, of the joy, joy of learning, is the art of learning, is the art of living. <clears throat> and we have lost that art, unfortunately. The other, which is more difficult, is to have a balance between emotion and <clears throat> intellect. Krishnaji said in a talk in Bombay, I think in 1984, put your intellect in your heart 
it has no value outside it. That's a rather startling statement. It has no value outside it, is what he is saying. Because pure intellectual ability can make you completely heartless. The greatest tyrannies have been perpetrated by people who were extremely clever at their profession, like Hitler or Alexander or any of those Mussolini and so on, Stalin, and right now Putin. But it is important, <laughs> therefore, not to just emphasize technique and achievement, but in the context of the heart, which means the emotions. So if there is love and compassion, then the technique has value. And that's what is the meaning of a religious mind. In religion also, <clears throat> there are the rituals, the belief, the prayer, the going to a temple and so on. Those are the methods of religion. And there is the spirit of religion, which is the spirit of love, compassion, nonviolence. If the spirit of <coughs> religion is missing, then you have an empty shell, <coughs> which you call religion. You are violent, you are hateful, and you consider yourself religious. You know what's going on in our country right now. So much hatred in the name of religion is being spread. <clears throat> there is not an understanding of what true religion is. So unless the spirit of religion is imbibed, <clears throat> the techniques don't take you to the spirit. The technique never creates the spirit. But once you have the spirit, it will find a technique to express itself. <clears throat> so that is an important aspect of this art of learning. That it is, you cannot get the spirit from a teacher or a book. You have to learn that for yourself. And that's why it is part of self-knowledge. So when Krishnaji talks about a learning mind, is talking about all this learning, which one has to do for oneself, through one's own observation and one's own inquiry into life. And of course, <clears throat> elsewhere, he has talked about it and we have discussed it. The role of conditioning, how that blocks us from perceiving what is beyond, and the need to free the mind of conditioning, which means you don't identify with any ideology or any conditioning. That is necessary for an open, to have an open learning mind. So all this is part of the art of living, the art of learning, the art of listening, the art of relating, and the ability to harmonize both within oneself and in one's relationships so that there is not a single conflict and one just lives from day to day joyously. Thank you, I'll end it here and perhaps we can have some discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Krishna. If anybody wanted to ask a question, please raise hand or comment, whatever you like. Naidu, please unmute and say. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, I have a question, sir. Yes, please. So, uh, what is the difference between desire and duty, sir? 
uh, I'm confused because I'm doing a duty. There lies a desire also or fulfilling my duty or livelihood. At the same time, uh, apart from duty, I have my desires. Uh, so while doing duty, I cannot tighten to my uh, desires or fulfill my desires. Or my duty may be stretched for uh, uh, another couple of hours, let's say six to eight o'clock, but my desire, which the time frame between six and eight, so what should I do? Should I continue my job? Or should I stop my job because that is my prime livelihood or duty? Or should I uh, continue or uh, discontinue the job and uh, fulfill my desire? I've got your question, yes. <clears throat> this conflict arises because we enter into a job which we don't love to do. If right from the beginning, you enter into a work which you really enjoy doing and you love to do that work, then there is no such conflict. Do you have that conflict, for example, in relating with your child whom you love? You do everything for your child and you enjoy that relationship. The sense of duty is promoted when there is when it is it will not happen without that because there is no joy being experienced in that so this dilemma <clears throat> is the dilemma of our life to which krishnaji is pointing out that we have become insensitive and we don't we are not sensing the joy in our relationships both with nature with people with friendships and so on. And that's what creates this dilemma that you have to postulate a duty and then rules and then punishments. If you don't perform the duty, then you will be punished and so on. The free mind is one which does the right thing without an incentive, without being pushed, without requiring to postulate a sense of duty. So you look after your mother and your parents, not because it's your duty, but because you love them. Then the duty ceases to be in opposition to what you wish to do. You want to do that. Of course, the whole of life has got this, the, the whole passage which I read he pointed out that we have given so much importance to making a living that we have become mechanical in that. And we have stopped perceiving the joy in life. So the dilemma arises because of that. And so in a Krishnamurti school, it is considered very important to help a child to discover where his innate talent lies and to pursue that. Not necessarily that which will earn you maximum money and position and fame and status and so on. So you may be, you may enjoy gardening or you may enjoy art and you, you devote that, you learn that. So right from the beginning, but society, we have created a society where achievement has become very important and that prevents this from happening. Kapil Sharma. Uh, yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, uh, sir, my question is, uh, what is the role of uh, teacher and books uh, in our life uh, uh, for teaching, uh, for learning? Uh, to learn means to learn what is the role of uh, teacher and books uh, without uh, conditioning the mind. <clears throat> I pointed out in my talk, there are things which one can learn from a teacher. You can learn the techniques from a teacher. He can also inculcate this sense of inquiry in your mind because he can share 
important questions of life with you, which you need to look at. Those questions sometimes arise from your experience in life, but sometimes they don't arise. Not all questions will arise. And therefore the, the teacher's role of creating the question in your mind. And that is what Krishnaji was doing. He was not giving us answers. He was creating these questions and saying, look at these questions and find out for yourself. That is more important than merely uh, repeating my words or following my teaching. <clears throat> you can't follow. Without the wisdom, you can't follow the teacher. So to come upon that wisdom, you have to come upon the sensitivity which is there in the teacher. What you can learn is you can get the knowledge, like the knowledge of mathematics and so on, but the spirit, the joy of all that, you get by yourself. You have to work at it. When you engage in that activity with a learning mind, the spirit will develop. Balram Bairagi, yeah. you can ask. Yeah. Uh, Professor, sir, uh, I have two questions for you, sir. So if you think uh, it is good and it is not uh, interviewing or personal, uh, you can respond. Uh, two questions is, first question is that you are also having a body cell like us and you have spent a considerable time. So I want to know from your own experience, uh, what is your achievement so far? If you think uh, you have achieved anything in life, that's my first question. And second question is that... No, let uh, me take one question at a time. <clears throat> at my age, it becomes difficult to remember all the questions and so on. So <clears throat> if you can keep your second question, I'll answer it, but sure, sir. one by one, one after the other. So... <clears throat> It's one thing to ask what is the right way to deal with one's body and what is the right relationship with one's body. It's another to ask what have you achieved? How is that important to you? For your learning, whether I have achieved or not, are you saying that if you have achieved, then I will study Krishnamurti. Because if you have not achieved, then why should I study Krishnamurti? It has no value. <clears throat> that is still the commercial mentality. What will I get out of this? And so on. You don't relate to Krishnamurti like that. He's creating questions and he is saying. <clears throat> Don't accept what I say. What I am saying is pointing towards the truth, but it is not the truth. You have to come upon the truth and discover it for yourself. Only then you have the truth. I can't give you the truth. So that's the way one relates. And there is no need to measure oneself where one has got. And compare yourself with others and feel either disappointment or elation. All that is a psychological game with which our mind plays. If you are really interested in learning, the question is the jewel. And your exploration is your exploration. It has nothing to do with whether another person has achieved something or not. This is not an achievement. <clears throat> Freedom is not a throne to which you have to reach. It's just an inquiry. If you are interested in the inquiry, engage in it. If you are not interested, throw it away. You, can, you have a complete freedom to live the way you want to live. Other question, Balram Behra. Other question. Yes, yeah, second yes, question. <laughs> yeah, the second question is, sir, Again, it is could, it could be sound like a personal. Uh, 
do you feel blessed sir if yes or no uh, how, how will you explain it sir if you think hmm. it depends on how you look at life you know life brings certain joys certain pleasures it also brings certain difficulties and certain sorrows and so on you can either feel grateful to life for all that it has given you or you can keep complaining that there was this difficulty and there was this problem and that man insulted me and so on so on it's each, each individual affects that choice <clears throat> and the art of learning is to solve this riddle because the way you are approaching it determines how you feel as a scientist i would say just to give you a metaphor is 50 a large number or is it a small number that question can't be answered 50 is larger than 49 and smaller than 51 but is it large or small if you don't compare no it is what it is you have to learn you have to deal with life and in learning you learn to deal with life <clears throat> depending on what capacities you have and so on you learn to deal with life this comparison is a mental disease you can compare with people more fortunate than you and you can keep on feeling depressed or you can compare yourself with your servant or with the poor people and you can keep feeling that you are extremely fortunate in life the truth is you are what you are it's neither fortunate nor unfortunate the mind creates these both fortune and misfortune thank you sharma. thank you sir sharma kapil sharma yeah sir uh, uh, actually i have uh, heard uh, i have uh, read somewhere that uh, the con- we are sharing the consciousness uh, with all humanity uh, with all human beings so sir my question is uh, uh, the I means the capacity of understanding uh, myself and the capacity of understanding who is living in very poverty who has not uh, any education or background support uh, so uh, my understanding uh, capacity is different uh, than this uh, internally we all are same so is there any factor uh, behind that uh, that uh, 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 there could be the reason of karma or uh, there could be the reason of uh, Uh, past life uh, that 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 i ask myself several times why this difference since we are internally we all are one then why this capacity is different to understand the things the scientific answer is <clears throat> that each one of us is born with a set of genes which determine our capacities and our limits at least in the biological sense <clears throat> but that is part of nature but there is also nurture depending on whether what are the circumstances under which you grow up what kind of education you receive what kind of atmosphere in which you develop so what actually takes place is a combination of both the nature the scientists will say is genetic and nurture which is the environment around you <clears throat> now the poor man may be born with very good genes but if he doesn't have education then naturally that kind of understanding which we receive in education the mind doesn't develop in that way so it's a combination of both these and whether why you get those particular genes the scientists will say it is accidental 
The religious man will attribute it to karma or something, past life that has determined. Nobody really knows. Prabhakar Sarma. Sir, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. I have a question. This is, we often talk about the bliss, ecstasy and joy. Are they found in oneself or they are found in relation to the what we observe outside? <clears throat> what is outside and what is inside you are very intimately related to each other. <clears throat> I grew up in India in a theosophical family and my parents were educationists and so on. So those circumstances gave me certain opportunities which enabled learning and development. If I was born in a poor house in a village in India, I wouldn't have had those opportunities. So this is a factual thing <clears throat> which takes place. And that's what I meant, that it is both the nature and the nurture. For instance, if Krishnamurti was not picked up by the Theosophical Society, would he have still developed into a sage and so on, or did he need that education and background and those questions, religious questions in his mind and so on, for him to develop? If he had just been, I mean, he was asked this question. And he said, if I was not picked up by the Theosophical Society, I would have been dead like all my brothers and sisters. So, there is also the importance of the people who educate you, who look after you, and so on, provide you food and subsistence. So both the circumstances and <clears throat> your innate nature, what in Hinduism is called the dharma, it's misunderstood as religion, Dharma is not religion. Dharma is your innate nature. It's the dharma of the tiger to eat the goat. It's not his decision to eat the goat. It's his dharma. Like that. Of course, you are welcome to ask in Hindi. Hindi may be push sakte hai. सर मेरा प्रश्न जो है सर अब आवाज आ रही क्या सर मेरी आवाज आ रही है आ रही आ रही सर मेरा सवाल तकनीक और हैबिट को लेके है जैसे सर आ, मैं जैसे जिस, जब हम तकनीक की बात करते हैं जैसे सर योगा कर रहे हैं तो सर खुशी मिलती है अच्छा लगता है लेकिन सर हमारी खुशी जो है फिर योगा पे डिपेंडेंट हो, हो जाती है जिस दिन हम नहीं कर रहे हैं उस दिन हमको अच्छा ही नहीं लगता तो सर तकनीक को मतलब जीवन में कितना महत्व देना चाहिए सर एक तो ये है दूसरी चीज सर जब भी हम कोई अच्छी आदत बनाने की कोशिश करते हैं तो हम आदत पे डिपेंडेंट हो जाते हैं तो सर इस चीज को लेके मेरा सवाल था कि तकनीक को जीवन में कितना इम्पोर्टेंस इम्पोर्टेंस देना चाहिए सर हाँ सही बात है <laughs> अगर लर्निंग माइंड के साथ में टेक्निक को किया जाए तो आदतन नहीं बनती आदत नहीं बनती लर्निंग आती है उसमें से और अगर आपने टेक्निक को खाली महत्व दे दिया और अवेयरनेस और माइंड उसके साथ में एसोसिएटेड नहीं रखा तो वो मैकेनिकल हो जाता है ये योगा के साथ भी सच है तो जो कृष्ण जी ने कहा वो खुद डेढ़ दो घंटा रोज सुबह योगा करते थे और प्राणायाम भी करते थे लेकिन उन्होंने कभी इसको महत्व नहीं दिया कि ये करना जरूरी है उन्होंने डिस्कवर किया कि उनके शरीर के लिए और उनके मन के लिए वैसा करना उचित था 
पर उन्होंने कभी ये नहीं कहा कि एनलाइटनमेंट के लिए या विजडम के लिए आने के लिए आपको ये सब करना चाहिए कुछ दूसरे लोग जॉगिंग करते हैं कुछ और लोग दूसरा व्यायाम करते हैं जिम्नास्टिक्स करते हैं लेकिन शरीर को व्यायाम की जरूरत होती है और योगा एक प्रकार का व्यायाम है अब जो वाकई में यदि आप योग सूत्र वगैरह पढ़े तो योगा पूरा जो कृष्ण जी बोल रहे हैं वो सारा का सारा योगा है इट इंक्लूड्स द आर्ट ऑफ लिविंग एंड एवरीथिंग लेकिन जिस चीज को हम लोग हट योग को हम लोग योग कह रहे हैं आजकल सब पूरी दुनिया में उसी को एक्सरसाइज बना के रख दिया है अपन ने वो खाली शरीर की फ्लेक्सिबिलिटी उससे डिटर्मिन होती है तो जरूरी नहीं है कि उस चीज को मैकेनिकल वे में किया जाए जरूरी ये है कि जो भी टेक्निक आप प्रैक्टिस करें उसके साथ में आप अवेयरनेस को जागृत रखें संदीप थैंक यू सर संदीप यू कैन आस्क प्लीज अनम्यूट संदीप एंड आस्क वो हाथ को ऊपर ऊंचा करके चले गए दिखते अभी अभिषेक पांडे यू कैन कम और हेलो सर 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 संदीप दिस साइड जो संदीप सर एक्चुअली सॉरी सर फॉर डिले फॉर द म्यूटिंग द एक्चुअली सर माय क्वेश्चन इज दैट दैट कंपैरिजन इज एन इनहेरेंट क्वालिटी ऑफ द ब्रेन और वी कैन से इट्स वेरी मैकेनिकल तो हाउ टू गेट रेड ऑफ रेड रेड ऑफ द कंपैरिजन फ्रॉम समथिंग टू समथिंग लाइक is there any technique or only observation is the only thing no, there be technique, not technique but certainly inquiry helps i mean why do i compare if you ask that question of yourself and what comparison does to our life <clears throat> and observe do, do it not just intellectually through analysis but actually observe in your life the consequences of comparing yourself then you will discover for yourself provided you have a learning mind you will discover for yourself that all jealousy all uh envy all feelings of superiority inferiority they arise from this comparison now do these things help you do you do better because you feel inferior and you want to defeat the other person or can you do better because you demand excellence of yourself it has nothing to do with the other person <clears throat> so those are the questions and if you pay attention to these questions in your life you will discover for yourself that comparison is not really necessary in fact it creates a lot of unnecessarily unnecessary uh negative emotions in our consciousness and therefore if you discover that you see the danger of what it does the mind will stop comparing you don't have to compare abhishek pande abhishek pande अभी सर पांडे जी मेरी आवाज आ रही है सर आ रही है आ रही है आ रही है हाँ प्रणाम कृष्ण जी मेरा एक प्रश्न था आपने एक वाक्य जो कहा था कि आज का जो वर्तमान दृश्य चल रहा है रिलीजन को लेके तो मैं आपके विचार जानना चाहता हूँ आप किस प्रकार से महसूस करते हैं और किसी वर्ग विशेष में जो जागृति कह लें दूसरे अर्थों में आप कह लें तो आपका क्या दृष्टिकोण है आपके मन में क्या महसूस होता है दृष्टिकोण बहुत कुछ जो कृष्ण जी ने कहा है उससे निर्धारित हुआ है क्योंकि साइंस के अलावा मैंने और कोई फिलोसफी वगैरह को ज्यादा अध्ययन किया नहीं है कृष्ण जी को ही पढ़ता था तो दो मेरे इन, दो चीजों में मेरी रुचि थी एक फिजिक्स साइंस थ्रू फिजिक्स और दूसरा रिलीजन थ्रू कृष्ण तो मेरी जो परिभाषा है वो वही है जो कृष्ण जी ने समझाया कोई अलग नहीं 
धन्यवाद सर नायडू प्लीज अनम्यूट एंड आस्क सर सर इन इन कंटिन्यूस टू माय फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन सर आई लिव आई लिव मोमेंट टू मोमेंट सर सो आई कंप्लीट माय जॉब फिनिश माय ड्यूटी एंड आई हैव वन मोर ड्यूटी सर व्हिच इज टेकिंग केयर ऑफ माय ओल्ड पेरेंट्स आई हैव टू प्रिपेयर फूड एंड एवरीथिंग so once my first job is finished i mean that my livelihood if that other two hours is stretched so i cannot uh, 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 attend to my parents timely attendance or prepare food for my old parents so there is a conflict sir because see my, uh, that up to 6 o'clock so my mind will just uh, wavering say when will i reach my home when will i prepare food my so that is also my duty and that that also gives me happiness as well as i as i said i live moment to moment so there is a uh, conflict there is a friction uh, and i i i'm i may not be able to concentrate on my the job which i am doing i understood so, your question i have understood your question may thank, i answer thank you sir thank you sir. this is a problem of time management there are only 24 hours in the day and we have several responsibilities there is our work there is our family there are elderly parents there may be a neighbor who is sick a friend who needs your help so one has to apportion time for each one of these now either you give importance to one and not the other then you produce you make this that this is more important than that so i will first do this then do this and sort of linear thing like that not necessary to do that if you can <clears throat> you can look at life holistically and some day when your parents need more attention you can take day off from your office and do what is necessary for them and another day you can ask your wife to look after your parents and do that extra work so these arrangements one has to make in one's life because one has multiple responsibilities your children are also responsible you have to take them to school and bring them back from school so you have to find time for all this now if you are not able to find time then <coughs> you are probably taken too many responsibilities on yourself so you need to find out whether you can shed some of those responsibilities or give them over to others <clears throat> so it's a very practical uh thing which you have to do in life everybody we all have to do that time management r vijay k different task r vijay k ji sir uh, am i uh, audible yeah yeah Ji, ji. Uh, Krishna ji, there's this question. Uh, yeah. You just a couple of uh, uh, expressions before you talked about the comparisons uh, and uh, the comparison mind, which is uh, kind of uh, creating the conflict. But normally in day-to-day -day living or in the scientific temperament, if we're talking about these comparisons, are a requirement to select the best model to take it forward uh, uh, to reach targets, goals, and all. uh so th the scientific temperament of the mind which is uh, utilized uh, is uh, doing all this but does that does the mind become just that in every sphere of life and if so why is it so yeah <clears throat> that's why when you look at life holistically and you want to understand whole of life <clears throat> you will discover for yourself where measurement is right and it is important to do that and where measurement has no role and it would be stupid to do measurement there the same is true about thought there are things which you have to think about and where thought has a role and if you don't use thought it will go wrong there are also areas in life where thought has no role 
So knowing this right place of thought, right place of knowledge, right place of comparison and measurement, and the wrong place is part of self-knowledge. No faculty which nature has endowed us with is completely unnecessary. Memory is necessary. Intelligence is necessary. Language is necessary. Body is necessary. <clears throat> Emotions are necessary. All these are necessary. What is not clear is why nature endowed us with the capacity for beauty, perception of beauty, because scientists don't know, because that doesn't seem to be necessary for survival. So Darwin's theory that those traits developed which uh, lead to survival doesn't apply. You can survive without any sense of beauty. You will just not have all that joy in life. So not necessary for survival, but we are very fortunate that nature has given us a consciousness which has this capacity for beauty, which is a bit of a mysterious capacity. Sir, can you expand on the beauty? Which, sir, sir, sorry, sir. Can you expand a little bit on this beauty, uh, which seems to be uh, for the, um, uh, which seems to be uh, not of the mind, or what is it, sir? The beauty. Could you just expand on that, please? <clears throat> well, no, if you, if you attend my talk, this today's talk, the whole so talk I... was about uh, beauty, you know, art of living. Okay, okay sir. And... I'll 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 rejog back on that. I yeah, came a little please. late. Thank you very much. Those passer, please unmute and ask. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, my question is that is there really a job, sir, which we love, or is there really a job which is joyful? Why I ask this question is because uh, any job at the end of the day we will become physically exhausted, sir. And there are both happy moments and sad moments in a job. Uh, if we see on job as a source of happiness or joy then when sad moments come I, I will feel like only going away from my work sir, from my job so my question is i want to know is there really a job sir which we love and which which gives us joy it is difficult because society has framed all these jobs and structure with only uh, achievement and econ economy in mind <clears throat> and that whole mindset is the problem But if one needs also, one cares for also, like in education, for example, you can, you most of the educational institutions only lay stress on passing the exams and achieving results and getting admission into IIT and so on. If that is your aim of education, then naturally all these things follow that you get into a profession which gives you maximum rewards and maximum money. And all week you are doing things which you don't really enjoy. And therefore on the weekend, you have to just have drinks and uh, relax, uh, overcome that. So we have divided life into a part which is boring and another part where we run away from that life. Which is what uh, that passage which I read from Krishnamurti explained that, that. And this whole thing is a wrong kind of setup in society. But of course, growing up in this society, you can't change that. So the employer may demand. And that is what creates this problem. <clears throat> but what you can do is right from the beginning. When one is a child, you can observe where does the talent of the child lie? So the dancer will dance, the musician will sing, the writer will write, the journalist will comment, and so on. So we all, there are multiple areas. But if you pick up an area just because in that area you will have maximum money, 
so that everybody is nowadays trying to go into computer science because then you will get a job and have good amount of money. <coughs> you have to find out why money has become so important in life. For some people, it may be. For your servant, maybe money is important because he needs food and medicine and milk for his children and he doesn't have the money for that. So for him, it's a priority. But for most of us, it continues to be a priority and that is simply an infection of what we get from the society because everybody else is valuing money so highly. Therefore, we also begin to value money so highly. So it becomes an intrinsic question in part of self-knowledge. What is the right place of life, money in our life? <clears throat> to understand that, I have to inquire, what are the things money can buy? And what is the importance of those things in my life? And what are the things that money can't buy? When you do that, you will find that Money can buy food, money can buy travel, money can buy clothes, etc. But money can't buy happiness, money can't buy peace of mind, money can't buy love, affection, money can't buy a sense of beauty or sensitivity. So the greatest things in life are those which money can't buy, then why has money become so terribly important? So I'll give you a question. <clears throat> you know, we have all been students and in student life, we lived in a small hostel, uh, <clears throat> small room with just a bed and so on. We have all heard that life. Now from that, you get your education, you get a job, and if you are, you consider yourself lucky if you are able to now lead a five-star life in a five-star hotel and so on. But <clears throat> you were worrying in that small room in your hostel about your exams and your results and what your teachers will think of you. And you are worrying now in this five-star hotel in a condition, air-conditioned room. Huh? What is happening and what your investments are doing and all this kind of thing. So doesn't worry spoil the quality of your life? So does money determine the quality of our life? What about the quality of the mind? That's why it is necessary for human beings to have this self-knowledge. <clears throat> the animal is not capable of it. He doesn't need it. Because for him, everything is completely determined by nature. What he will eat, what he will not eat, everything is determined by nature. But for a human being, this question arises. What is right thinking? What is right life? What is how? And therefore, you need self-knowledge. You need to learn about yourself and about consciousness. Unfortunately, in education, we have neglected this aspect. And that's what Krishnaji is emphasizing. Dr. Mathur, Dr. Mathur, Dr. Mathur, please. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Just I wanted to put a small question to Krishnaji. And... Firstly, I want to pay my regards. Actually, I was not in India, but I have read a book about mantra, mantra and music. Just I want to know yeah. what mantra and how far, how many minutes I can read. And any mantra, if you can <laughs> suggest for me. Thank you very much. I am not an expert in mantras, so I can't really advocate what mantra you should uh, practice. The only thing I can advocate is find out for yourself by practicing that with a learning mind. 
and you will discover for yourself because all kinds of people are recommending all kinds of things the yogi will which, uh, which i should follow i want to know from you what your experience i'm answering that question there is no yes. nobody else can give you that answer i am yeah. saying you have to find out for yourself and apparently you have not learned to discover for yourself you learn and for learn. How, how many minutes i can do spare for it <laughs> i am asking so you so 10 out. minutes will do 10 minutes that guy it if 10 minutes suits you do it 10 minutes it okay minutes. thank you sir Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Pradeep Verma, sir. Doctor Pradeep Verma, yes. only four minutes are left now. You are always okay. last one. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, audible, I think. Yes. Yes. Namaste, Pradeep. <clears throat> Namaskar, sir. Namaskar. <laughs> Whatever we have discussed today relates to consciousness, and consciousness is largely subjective. with all its forms including ego and all that then we have borrowed a very important thing transformation of consciousness into a new mind whether this newness is also subjective question is it really new another question because the moment each moment is a timeless moment when all the time is there so that includes the past also so whether it is really new so that and that question is there and subjectivity is new, largely new for that individual individual if, that's right that's if he goes if instead of approaching life with an egoistic mind and achieving mind yes he transforms to approaching life with a learning mind which is not egoistic that's yeah that yeah. that yeah. that is a major transformation as far as that individual is concerned <clears throat> and whatever i have therefore it is, new. it is new because he has he is not living that way for him it it's is good. New. it is good that you talked about individuality and the importance of individuality here so art of living all the factors associated with art of living sensitivity love spirit spirit of religion everything attentiveness is largely subjective isn't it so whether a message whether a message or communication or communion can deliver this to a person who is not endowed with some of these blessings <clears throat> pradeep ji it is that we stand on the same ground somebody approaches life very egoistically strongly becomes a man like hitler somebody yes. else is non egoistic and wanting to learn and so on and becomes some someone like gandhi let's say but basically when you are born as a child all you have are those genes and a consciousness and language and so on so which way it will go you don't determine that but you can learn about that and that that learning is learning about oneself because you have also to accept your body realistically not everybody has the same kind of body not everybody has the same talents but everybody has language everybody has intelligence everybody has thinking ability so a lot of it is common but it's like all people trees are people trees but not all people trees are identical in the same way all human beings are largely human beings they are similar but they are not identical and you have to discover for yourself where your abilities and talents lie and in what direction you need to go nobody else can dictate that and that nobody is what is saying that self knowledge is necessary for man 
sir gene sir, supply time is, is over time is over sir, just, is just, over. sir just, 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 just just let me say then you say whatever you like time okay. is over may i may i extend it professor krishna because yes, two yes. persons are left yeah fine your posi your position is like yeah i am fine fine okay okay now pradeep you can go ahead yes yes you know, you, you, you know genes appear to be deterministic because they are material and can be seen but their working their functioning is largely dependent on the environment that has been proved enough uh, in epigenetics the latest to so environment becomes very very important because switching on and off of genes depend almost entirely on environment so uh, this is a good thing in a sense because uh, understanding is becoming holistic slowly and steadily it is uh, the, the 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 fixity of science has been diluted to yes sir your sound has you got muted sir Pradeep ji, you got muted halfway through, but I have got your question. No sound. I've got your no. question, so I can respond. Yeah, please, please do it, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> The environment determines our conditioning. Right. now we have this capacity also to question our conditioning and go beyond it awareness is not a conditioned quality thought is a conditioned entity and we are normally our decisions are based on thought and therefore the conditioning plays a major role but it's not completely binding so you can come out of it and you find examples of this After all, Krishna Murthy grew up as a theosophist in the theosophical society right from childhood. Now, how did he discover that something totally new, that truth is a pathless land? Because they all believed in evolution, they believed in all the different religions as paths to truth and so on. Similarly, Jesus Christ came out of Jewish religion. Buddha went out of so we have this capacity to come out of our conditioning and get up. Now I asked that's my answer, but I also asked Krishna Ji this question that uh, sir uh, is is are some of these things instinctive and therefore <laughs> and his his one line answer was nothing is in it. Nothing is in it. that means you can you can go beyond it so i would recommend since of it there is paucity of time if you have not read the book wholeness of life there are dialogues with david bohm and some other people and in those dialogues <coughs> krishna ji points out that all this freedom from conditioning freedom from the ego is all is all elementary beginning learning does not even begin until you cross that cross that and beyond that when you have learned about yourself by watching your thinking and your conditioning and you have gone beyond that then the collective unconscious enters into the consciousness it can also be watched and empty and then the racial unconscious enters into the consciousness so it was very far <laughs> we are we are struggling at the first door which is freedom from the ego those are very interesting uh, dialogues uh, i would recommend just three or four dialogues are there but they are very interesting wholeness of life tells you how much what is possible for a human being i'm not saying it's easy <laughs> it's not easy for I me mean, krishna ji was just one person who <laughs> out of all those he was talking to 
Yes, it is possible. Sir, should so I allow Noor Muhammad to ask? Should I yes. allow Noor Muhammad? Noor Muhammad yes. is left. Yes. Please, please allow. But Noor Muhammad, but, Noor Muhammad, please you yes. can yes. mute and ask. Thank you. After a long time, I am seeing your face. You need to speak either. <laughs> <laughs> so we are not Namaste. completely determined by the genes and by the environment. That's the answer. For Krishnaji's answer, not mine. <laughs> Noor Muhammad, please go ahead. Noor Muhammad, good day, good day. please. Yeah, very good day, Professor Krishnaji, and thank you, Sushilji. I'm very much, uh, uh, very much uh, grateful to have such a good platform where we can ask questions in an environment of freedom. Uh, like I wanted to, uh, I'm just wondering that I'm been, you know, so much. Uh, fascinated by the case teaching since many few years and uh, and I'm very grateful for it and uh, you know more and more I went into it I went into the teachings of uh, Krishnaji it opened many doors for me for the questions and and uh, it gave me a very inquiring mind and I also understood uh, somewhat what is a learning mind and this is all happening but I'm wondering uh, like you know when Krishnaji talks about the transformation of mind the transition, the transformation. So, you know, my mind wonders whether, you know, since many years I've been reading Krishnaji, I'm in touch with K friends and I'm talking about it. And I just also know the significance and, and the utter significance of observe, observing our own self and all these things where there, there is no effort required. It is an effortless thing, which is just been understood. So like, what is my question is like, you know, all these years, understanding all these things and knowing the, the, like honestly seeing myself, how much hypocrite I am, how much silly I am, or how much some goodness are also, also there in my being. So like, I wonder if the, like K is talking about transformation, but I don't see any transformation in myself. Like, and I also am not at all worried about uh, whether I will be transformed or not. So, am I on the right path? Like, is it is it that we will not? My mind will never be able to witness transformation, which has been very urgent in this crisis of the world, and which is very important as an ind individual level. I've got your question, sir. I've got your question. <clears throat> Let me answer. Do we read physics? because we want to become Einstein? The answer is no. We study physics in order to know how nature functions. No. And to the extent to which we understand that, to that extent we have come upon the understanding of how nature functions. But Einstein had much greater understanding than that. And we don't reach that understanding. <clears throat> Only a few people reach that understanding. Now, in the same way, the important transformation of consciousness, as I understand it, which Krishnaji is asking us to come upon, is not to transform our qualities, but to transform our approach to life. The approach of achievement can give way to an approach of learning. So, I don't know who wrote that, but there is a saying that life is not a problem to be solved. It's a mystery to be lived. And it's very true. That's what Krishnaji is saying, that it's a mystery. It is not meant for achieving results and prob solving problems and so on. Uh, you approach it with a learning mind. A mystery has to be approached with a learning mind. Now, wherever that takes you, <clears throat> why do you measure? You measure because you have some idea of what an enlightened being is, and you want to make that into an achievement. Now, if you work, if you do all this inquiry in order to become an enlightened man, you are sustaining the ego because th that the, the achievement seeking enlightenment it sustains the ego. 
So it's not freedom from the ego. So the freedom from the ego is this freedom from measurement, the doing this inquiry for the love of it. And wherever it takes you, you discover that for yourself where it takes you. Now, it's not as hopeless as it may seem, this answer, because supposing you have understood very clearly, <clears throat> even intellectually, that comparing yourself with other people is a disease of the mind, which creates a lot of upheaval in your consciousness. And so you stop doing it. You stop comparing yourself with others who are more successful or less successful and so on. You stop measuring all that. It's a lot of freedom. You have, you have freed yourself of envy, of jealousy, of inferiority, of superiority, of depression, so many things. It's not a small thing. So even though you may not be an enlightened being, you are, in my opinion, you are a wiser man, free from a lot of problems and a lot, lot of wastage of energy. So you have more energy now to inquire further and learn further. There is no end to this learning. And don't make an end to this learning. If you make an end to this learning, it will turn into a desire process. And all the consequences of the desire and ego will come into it. Just do it for the love of it. And don't, don't, no need to measure where you have got. No need to measure. Sir, I have, thing, you know, I have to end it somewhere, sir. I have to end it. Two questions are still left. Someone from Fine. Japan wanted to ask a question and Mr. Malpuri is, uh, is also willing to ask. So, I, so, so please be brief, be brief in answering that. You accepted the responsibility of being the coordinator. Take a decision. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's your yes. responsibility. <laughs> sir, sir, my responsibility ends. Don't I will end it here. Me. I will end it here. I just showed you my intention in the morning also because I feel that it will be a taxation over your throat, sir. So please let me end it. Please, please let me end it. Please yes, allow me to end it, sir. Yes, of course. No, sir, no, please. I'm... Sir, please entertain one small question, sir. Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> sir. Sir, you are overruling the coordinator, isn't it, sir? Sir, uh, no, I mean, it is a small question, but... Uh, I'm willing to answer his question. It's up yeah. to you. You can prevent yeah, yeah, please, 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 please be brief in questioning, be brief in answering too. Sir, one, uh, uh, one, uh, one small uh, issue troubles every mind, sir. Every thinking mind. Why good people suffer in life? That is one thing. Similarly, so only why, one question. Sir, only yes, one question. He remembers yes. one question only. only so, one please, question. please, yes, please. Why good people suffer in life? Yes. And sir, why, you know, how, how do we explain these railway accidents, earthquakes, floods, wars, and all these things? And undeserved deaths in all these events. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> sir, psychological suffering is born of ignorance. That's what the Buddha taught, and that is true. Ignorance as illusion, not ignorance as lack of knowledge, but as illusion. <clears throat> that you can end. But physical suffering is a biological matter. You can't end that. If, you, if Krishnaji falls and breaks his bones, he will also have pain of fracture and he will have to be treated in the hospital and so on. He may not have developed self-pity as we all develop. So the psychological part can be dealt with. The physical part you have to accept in life whatever it is, is the kind of body you have, the kind of pains that come to you and so on. Sir, may I end it? Sir, may I end it now? Your job. Yes, sir. <laughs> sir, I am end. Uh, sir, thank you very much for answering. So, thank you very much for answering you, so, so many questions. Sir, I am now ending it. From some other time, we will be 
taking these questions again. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So it was a nice speech and nice question answer session. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Modak, please end it. Modak, 